This is G Free Radio. Here's your host, Peter Stewart. In this week's show, we start with news of a breakthrough in treating celiac disease. What if a vaccine and some booster shots could let you eat all the wheat-filled food you want without all the nasty consequences? Well, this week, news that a big announcement could be just around the corner. Our interviews this week are with the well-known gluten-free food author in the UK, Antoinette Saville. She's cooked across Europe for banquets and receptions and was an advocate for gluten-free food decades ago, well before most people had heard of it. And we hear from the man who says his gluten-free pasta has got to be the most authentic yet. (laughs) It's actually made in Italy itself. A new report that says the number of restaurants offering G-free food is on a terrific rise. We bring you those numbers. And a couple of teasers for you here. Number one, how much more can G-free food cost than normal food? And two, how much gluten a day does the average person eat? Those factoids in full in this week's show. Plus our G-free tweets of the week and what the heck do you do with mesquite flour? So, episode 45 of the G-Free Radio Show, coming at ya, as the kids say. And uh, this week, some uh, really interesting and, uh, yeah, important news about a vaccine for celiac disease. I know we've spoken about various vaccines which are being worked on at the moment, but this is our lead story this week because uh, there is a suggestion that a breakthrough could be pretty imminent. Let me tell you about this report from Exconomy.com. Um, And it's all about um, what is being called uh, Immusan T, which is a uh, a startup out of uh, Massachusetts, Cambridge, Massachusetts. And uh, that company is trying to develop a vaccine for celiac disease, as I mentioned at the top of the show. It's a vaccine and some booster shots that could let you eat all the wheat-filled food that you want without those kinds of nasty consequences that most of us are used to. Sometime within the next few months, according to this report, Immusan T is likely to report data from two separate early-stage clinical trials for a vaccine. They're calling it Nexvax2, and that vaccine they're developing for celiac disease. As I say, it is very early stages but a very interesting breakthrough in what they're talking about. Those data from two separate studies, one in the United States and another in Australia, and you know what, that is significant as well, that they're doing it on two different continents, will represent the first signals as to whether Immusan T is on to something in treating celiac disease. It's also the first move in a broader effort to prove that the company's concept of a peptide immunotherapy platform is viable. Their CEO is Leslie Williams, and she's quoted as saying, it's a very exciting first half of the year with the data that is pending. Now, of course, even if those studies are a success, they're really only the first step down a very long road for Immusan T. These two studies are phase 1B trials, and... What that means is they're designed to make sure that Nexvax2 is safe and to find a range of potential doses the company might be able to use in its next studies. And there'll be lots of clinical hurdles to come. We talked about a similar story, didn't we, a few weeks ago. And indeed, there are plenty of other companies trying to find treatment for celiac disease. Why wouldn't they? I mean, frankly, yes, they're there to help us. They're also there to make a bit of money as well. Both San Carlos, California-based Alvine Pharmaceuticals and Baltimore, uh, Maryland-based Alba Therapeutics are developing drugs that are supposed to be taken in combination with a gluten-free diet. Citari Pharmaceuticals, we've spoken about these kind of companies before. That's a startup which is emerging from a joint venture between GlaxoSmithKline and Avalon Ventures, recently raised $10 million to try and get a treatment for celiac disease. We mentioned that, as I say, a few shows ago. However, where does Immusan T sit alongside all of those different companies I've just mentioned. Well, for one 
key reason, according to Leslie Williams, the CEO of Imusan Tea, celiac patients might one day be able to eat gluten and as much of it as they want. So I know a few weeks ago we were talking about if you were just going to go out and have some pizza, you would take something before you did that and it would counteract any changes that would happen inside your stomach. This seems to be some kind of long-term treatment they're developing instead. Quote, we're the only treatment in development to date that is disease-modifying. She says our focus is disease modification so patients can resume an unrestricted diet. That is either very exciting for you or pretty scary because I know that some people would say, hold on, if my body is telling me not to eat a certain kind of food, then I don't want a drug that will mask the effects of me eating that. I want to be totally natural. Not only do I not want to put something else into my body, which could potentially mess around with other things that are going on, within my within my framework within my whole system um i'm just listening to my body and if my body says whoa gluten's not for you then i should take that on trust gluten is not for me but interesting nonetheless when people with celiac disease digest gluten as we know their immune system mistakes certain fragments of the protein as invaders and mounts an attack that causes inflammation damage to the intestine and impairs its ability to absorb nutrients and leads to things like, as we know, um, stomach pain, vomiting, diarrhea. So what is this treatment essentially going to be doing? Well, right now, the only real option for celiac patients is to completely avoid gluten. But Imusan T's idea is to inject patients with a vaccine containing engineered version of three gluten fragments that trigger the immune response in most celiac patients. These peptides, each about 15 amino acids long, are supposed to train the immune system to see gluten as food so it doesn't trigger an attack in the gut. As this report says, it all sounds a little bit weird. It sounds certainly counterintuitive, given that most vaccines teach the immune system to, a- to attack the injected molecules rather than to accept them. But... Williams likens the company's approach to kind of allergy shots, which help the body gradually learn to tolerate a particular allergen through a regimen of periodic injections. So, in Imizan T's case, injecting small amounts of the problematic peptides at regular intervals is kind of supposed to, I suppose you would say, reprogram patients' immune systems. And that would switch off disease-causing T-cells and induce clinical tolerance. In other words, it kind of resets the way the body responds immunologically. Imuzan T is anticipating that their regimen would be a two-step program. So this is what you would have to do, they reckon. First of all, you'd go through an induction phase managed by your physician, GP, doctor, gastroenterologist, how long that would last for they're not entirely sure at this phase Uh, but uh, then uh, what would happen is that you would get one or two shots a week for about eight weeks so your body can get the tolerance to gluten and then the company says in theory you will be able to eat gluten after that point potentially needing a few periodic booster shots um, just to kind of top up. They're not entirely sure how often that would be. The company has also developed a blood test that would help Imuzan T select responders to the treatment and periodically monitor the status of their response. It's really, really interesting uh, stuff. It was developed, that the whole basis of this, incidentally, was developed more than a decade ago. The actual foundation of what they're doing now developed more than 10 years ago at the University of Oxford, Uh, in the UK Um, and and they discovered that uh, peptides that appear to trigger the immune response in patients with the most common genetic subtype of celiac disease, those with copies of the gene HLA-DQ2.5 and they made small synthetic versions of them Um, and uh, then they wanted to develop that technology in the United States and they got together, they had to find some money Uh, various other people got on board as well and essentially saw how it could all be leveraged more broadly beyond celiac disease. Uh, and 
what they're thinking at the moment is the way they're working and the kind of logistics that they've got with the various peptides and the treatment may also be able to be adapted for, if I had a drum roll, I'd bring it to you now, other autoimmune disorders like type 1 diabetes and rheumatoid arthritis. So I guess, guys, they're starting off with us and then they could spin it out potentially to those other um, just as serious, uh, if not more serious, uh, kind of problems that an awful lot of people can have. Boy, oh boy, this is kind of uh, exciting stuff, isn't it? Uh, it really is. So what happens now if the two ongoing Phase 1B trials are successful, the type of studies Immusanti would have to run next are unclear. They'd have to look at the data that comes from those first trials uh, and then get back to the uh, FDA, the Food and Drug Administration in the US, to define their goals, what they hope to be getting out of future studies. But the big plan is to ultimately use celiac disease as a test case for peptide immunotherapy as a platform and if it's gonna you know if they can prove they're on to something uh, they've got enough funds to last through to the end of this year and hopefully what they come up with they'll be able to leverage some more money out of the various organizations the various government departments the various uh, banking organizations to fund another phase of trials and research really really interesting stuff and uh, i hope you agree that uh, you know that could be life changing, as we've said before in the program. Don't think this is just around the corner. This is this is years away, but it's always interesting, isn't it, to see something on the horizon rather than to have, if you don't mind me mixing my analogies, nothing on the roadmap at all. Antoinette Saville is an award-winning cookery writer, putting her name to recipes for the past 25 years and books, including Debrett's Dinner Party Cookbook. I mean, Debrett's, guys, you can't get you can't get better than that, really, can you? The Gluten, Wheat and Dairy-Free Cookbook and Learn to Cook Wheat, Gluten and Dairy-Free. She's cooked across Europe for corporate lunches, banquets and receptions, I was one of the founders of the gluten and wheat free movement more than 20 years ago. Her bread range is now available in Waitrose stores across the UK and also via Ocado.com. I am intolerant to gluten and wheat and at one point dairy as well. And I've been a cook all my life, had a catering company and did uh, huge corporate dinners and banquets and things in London. And after an accident uh, in the car, I wasn't allowed to eat any gluten, wheat or dairy for a bit. And so um, being a cook, I needed to find ways to get fabulous food for dinner parties, lunches, corporate events. And there was nothing. Uh, And there were no recipe books that I liked. There was no food that I liked. And so I just started making recipes. And thank goodness, the first thing I ever did was a carrot cake. And it was absolutely amazing because I made about uh, 10 awful things after that. But because I'd made the first thing absolutely spectacular, I was then able to start baking. And I went to HarperCollins Publishers and I said, let's do a cookbook for celiacs, gluten, wheat and dairy free that's glamorous that is easy and you can get the ingredients in any supermarket you don't have to go to a health food shop and everybody will enjoy it the whole family so all your friends all your family corporate events um, and they won't know that it is specifically allergy free and actually nobody else had done that everyone was aiming to cook food that you could eat if you could not have certain foods. And certainly this was a problem when I was diagnosed about eight or nine years ago. And as soon as I was diagnosed, that next birthday, that next Christmas, I had all sorts of cookery books and recipe books. And most of them were, have this, um, a cup of this really odd flour you've never heard of and a cup of something else you've never heard of. And you had to hunt around. And I thought, you know what? You would have done so many miles travelling. Let's just have a piece of bread or beans on toast or something. It wasn't worth the hassle. So it's really nice that you're making things really easy and straightforward. I think it is, and I think it's important because actually people are working hard, they don't have a lot of time, or 
and lots of small children and school runs and school hampers to do and lunch boxes and things like that. And they need to be able to do things quickly. So if you can buy our breads at Waitrose and do the rolls, I cut them in half and make mini pizzas for children. Um, I use the bread actually as part of cooking, which is why I love it. And uh, you can make um, cleaner puddings, treacle tarts, bread and butter puddings, um, savoury things like red sauce. So there's never any leftover. So when you've had some sandwiches, you've had toast, you can then use the breadcrumbs in recipes. And it freezes beautifully anyway, so that's great. And the pizzas are fantastic. And because they're very deep base, um, you can put fantastic, uh, really trendy and cool toppings on, as healthy or unhealthy as you like. And you can bake it at a really high temperature and it doesn't become hard around the edges. A lot of the very, very thin bases, because they're without gluten, they do become very, very hard and crusty. And actually not everybody wants to chew through a pizza. Um, and so ours are made in this way so that they are still soft, even though they, you can do a really hot bake. On it. And uh, so, you know, we as a family, we all eat um, our own... Uh, products. Well, you've got a discount, presumably. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and the the rolls and the the bread, you know, which are at Waitrose, are just now useful because they're they're all over the country. You know, Waitrose used to be a very sort of selective group with you know one every other county, and now they're everywhere. And so it's much easier for people to get our products, which is good. And, and obviously quite a surge in gluten-free food over the last few years, or people wanting to eat gluten-free food, either on the orders of their doctor or dietitian, or because they feel as though that it does something better for them inside. You must have seen the, that change come through with the, with the buying of your, of, of your books and, and the demand for your items in Waitrose. Well, certainly you, you really notice it. Um, going to these shows and also just meeting people um, around the country that um, people want to be healthier. So if you're celiac and you have to um, go without wheat that's and gluten, that, that's one thing. But actually a lot of people are choosing to do without wheat because it's not that digestible really for anybody. So people are trying alternatives and you can make wonderful things with other Grains nowadays, there's so many new products and exciting, and slightly things. different tastes and textures as well than boring old wheat, and you know all the quinoa and all those different grains. And what I try and do in my cookbooks is you know use different grains um, and make lovely soda breads and, and, and cakes and biscuits and things like that with a mixture of, of flours and grains, and whatever. So you don't you lose anything nutritionally because of course that's one of the great arguments about being gluten free is that you, you haven't got no minerals and natural vitamins and things like that in uh, the alternatives. So what you're trying to do is give a really fun and healthy uh, diet or special treat. And I'm really here to write about special treats. I do um, cakes and puddings and, and, and lovely sort of feasts, you know, for Christmas, birthdays, um, and that's what I what I like to do because actually the day-to-day -day nutritional stuff most people can manage. But when you want to make something really spectacular, that's where you need a bit of help with, you know, an anniversary cake or um, something very special for Easter, you know, a sort of gooey chocolate budgie cake or something. Um, and there's just ways of making them, um, which maybe not everybody knows. So that's what I try and do in my books. And you can read more about Antoinette Saville at Antoinette Saville, that's S A V I double L dot com, Antoinette Saville dot com. And next week, our series on various bread manufacturers continues. We go over to Ireland and we speak with the Pure Bread Company. That's bread without the A, and it's also without the gluten. Follow us on Twitter. We're at G Free Radio. So I mentioned a couple of teasers, didn't I, at the top of the programme. And uh, one of those was, how much gluten does the average person eat every day? Hmm, we'll come to that in a few moments' time. And also, you may want to get your little grey cells working on this teaser as well. And that is, how much do you think, on average, gluten-free food costs more than gluten-filled food? Hmm, interesting. 
ten percent more, twenty percent more, thirty percent. We'll bring you that stat in a few moments' time. First of all, just ahead of our next interview, incidentally, it's all about gluten-free pasta that's actually made. In Italy. And I guess you can't get much more authentic than that, can you? Uh, Let me bring you this little bit. Uh, And that is the answer to that first question I set you uh, a few seconds ago. And that is how much gluten does the average person actually uh, actually eat every day? I came across this in the middle of an article, uh, which is in uh, Scientific American, which I was uh, reading on your behalf. Uh, Let me read you this this paragraph. It's uh, most of this we kind of know already, guys, but uh, bear with me. Until the Middle Ages, the types of grain that people cultivated contained far smaller amounts of gluten than the crops we grow today. In the following centuries, even before people understood what gluten was, they selectively bred varieties of wheat that produced bread that was lighter and chewier, inexorably increasing consumption of the protein. As technology for breeding and farming wheat improved, Americans began to produce and eat more wheat overall. (coughs) Here we go. Today, the average person, brackets in the US, close brackets, eats around 132 pounds of wheat a year, often in the form of bread, cereal, crackers, pasta, cookies and cakes, which translates to about 0.8 ounces of gluten every day. Point a, that's a little factoid for you. I'm not entirely sure when you can drop that into normal conversation. Did you know that the average person eats 0.8 ounces of gluten every day? I didn't, and you know what? I'm not entirely sure what I'm going to do with that fact, but I've told you about it now. And <laughs> it's nothing if not educational, this programme. A little bit of information there for you. OK, moving on. Free from Italy sells genuine Italian food the G-free Italians themselves eat. The pasta is made with corn and rice and blended in Italy. They use a special pre-cooking technique, which they say eliminates that horrible, gloopy, kind of sticky mess that you can get with other kinds of pastas. And also, there's no soya, potato or lupin either. And also, no eggs, dairy or GMO. My name's Nigel Singh. I work for Free From Italy... Our ambition uh, is to bring the best quality Italian food from Italy that's gluten-free, dairy-free, egg-free to the UK. Our belief is that there is a lot of uh, it, uh, gluten-free products on the market, dairy-free products, but there's room in the market now for, at the top end for premium quality, authentic recipes like our pesto sauce that we believe is actually better than the brand leader in the UK. So tell me about some of the, the, some of the range you've got here. We'll start off, um, well, it's got to be Italian, hasn't it? So let's, let's start off with the pasta at the far end. Because okay. an awful lot of companies are doing the various pastas, and uh, sometimes they, they've got corn in, sometimes they've got rice in, and, and, and so on. Some of it goes clumpy, some you wash out a whole heap of starch afterwards. What that, about your pasta? How that, does that fit that, into all of that? That's right, uh, and that's one of the reasons that we've got... Uh, we're looking at the Italian product, um, and we're looking at the top end of the market. There is a lot of pasta out in there, and that market's grown dramatically over the last few years. Um, there is a lot of product out there where the manufacturers put things like potato starch in, lupin, um, and uh, soya. Uh, we, we've avoided that, and we've tried to produce a product that is as close as you're ever going to get to a traditional pasta and the kind of pasta that uh, Italians would want to eat. They want their pasta to be al dente. They don't want it to be sticky and gloopy. Oh, gloopy and sometimes falls apart, doesn't absolutely. it? You give it a stir or you wash it under the tap to get the starch out and it falls apart. You've got uh, a mess. Absolutely. Well, our La Buona Vita pasta is actually made by one of Italy's top Italian pasta manufacturers and this is what they would want to eat if they were celiac. Uh, so we've, we've got this, we're very proud and lucky to get this product from them. And um, they've allowed us to introduce it to the UK and be their distributor of this product. And you can see from the product, it's a nice golden yellow. It looks like pasta, tastes like pasta. It doesn't fall to bits when you cook it. It stays al dente. And that's really important for a simple product like pasta. It, it's a carrier for your sauces and you want it to perform. And this product does perform in that way. And you know, Italy, they say, is one of the best countries in the world to go to for gluten-free food. They understand the market, don't Absolutely. they? Absolutely. If you have a gluten uh, allergy, 
in Italy, you've got a big problem because Italians eat pasta twice a day. So if you if you've got an allergy, you've got to sort that out very quickly. And we know that Italians are serious about their food. Quality and freshness is really important to Italians. So they will go out their way to produce a product that fits their needs. And, and we that's what we're trying to find, not just with pasta, but in all areas where, the, where the, their consumers have got allergies, there's people trying to deliver a free-from product that matches or betters the, uh, the, the product that's out there that's a regular product for the for, for, Consumers that are lucky enough not to have any allergies. Now, apart from the uh, the, the the taste of pasta, I mean, that's not much taste of pasta itself, is no, there? there? You isn't. know, to be let's be quite honest. Yeah. And then you mentioned the word the carrier yes. of, uh, of of the uh, of the taste really is the pasta, and the taste itself comes from the various sources. Yes. So tell us about your range of sources. I can see. Well, actually, we're standing at the wrong angle here. I can see. Jars with white lids, jars with green lids and red lids and yellow lids. What's the difference between all of those? Okay, well, we, we've, got, we've got two tomato-based uh, sauces, Arribiata and Basilico. Now, these are uh, from a company called Conserva della Nonna. They are one of Italy's top sauce and uh, condiment manufacturers from Mad- uh, Madonna, which is the heart of cuisine in Italy from the Emilia Romana region. The thing about these products is the tomatoes are picked and packed within 24 hours. So you get that real freshness of the tomato, that Italian taste that you want. It's a very simple product. Uh, They're gluten-free, of course, and you can see that we use the uh, UK uh, Celiac uh, logo on there with the cross grain. And, uh, yeah, it's it's a simple product, but it, it delivers taste. And, and that's what you want. With the, with the Yaribiata, you've got a little bit of chilli, so you get a little bit of a, a kick from that, but you get a natural taste. And, the, and, and this, is a, this is the type of product that you would use to coat your pasta with, and you have a very simple dish that delivers quality. And then you've got our basil, uh, which is our flagship product at the moment. We've had this developed. And this is what UK. I tasted a few moments ago. This is yes. the pesto, isn't that's, it? That's that I had right. with, with the breadstick a that's moment ago. That's right, yes. And we've had other exhibitors here that are Italian companies that have come here and they've tried it and they've actually taken away our product to put on their product because they are so enamoured with this product. They've actually said they're proud enough to put this on their product. And then people are coming from their stands to our stands to buy. <laughs> and in fact, we are, we are going to sell out. That's all we've got left is a few jars. Uh, and we're really pleased with that. Asda took it straight away. The buyer tried it and said, that's a fantastic product. It's better than the standard product in the market. It's better than the brand leader. Um, so they've taken it. And it's doing very, very well. It's not just for people that have got allergies. Anyone would take that and they go, that's a great product. And that's our ambition, is to get products that anyone can eat. If you've got an allergy or not, you still go, that's a great product. And what I'm also really pleased to see is a couple of things. This end, the in, in yellow, the uh, uh, cartoon character or animated character, if you like, the uh, Bob the Builder shaped pasta, and also the pasta sauce as well. Well, I guess actually the pasta sauce is pretty much like your, your other pasta sauces, but it's that branding, isn't it, to appeal to the kids. So they are eating gluten-free, and they don't feel left out, and it's also doing good. Well, absolutely, and it's the not being left out that's really important, because children, when they eat, we know, I've, I've had kids, I'm sure you, you've, you've had kids, we know that meal times can be very difficult, because they want to eat all the things that we don't want them to eat, like <laughs> chocolate and crisps and biscuits. We want them to eat healthy foods like broccoli, carrots, pasta, uh, and you have to engage them. Now, when they've got an allergy, it's even more difficult because there's a lot of those fun products and unhealthy products that we don't want them to eat that's a treat for them that they can't even have them. So we developed this mainly because mums were coming to us at food shows like the BBC Good Food Show and saying, we like your products, but we really need something for kids. And we know that... 8% of children are diagnosed with some sort of allergy. And a lot of them grow out of it. But when they're young, they have more sensitivities. So this works really well. And we've had this product out in the market now for six years. And it continues to grow. And we're really, really pleased with it. We're actually going to be launching Hello Kitty 
gluten-free pasta in January because Bob the Builder... It's quite a boy brand, isn't it? It's a boy brand, <laughs> and we tried to tell mums that it was a unisex brand, but I'm afraid we've failed. So we, we, we're, we're actually come submitting to the pressure, and we're going to be launching Hello Kitty uh, gluten-free pasta in January. I must imagine that to get the authority to use Bob the Builder and Hello Kitty, you've got to jump through an awful lot of hoops. You can't just take some someone else's idea and use it on your on your own products because obviously there's all sorts of legal implications going on. Well, we, we, we have to buy a licence yeah. uh, and we have to prove to the owners of the characters that we are worthy. Um, you fit in with their brand. Yes, yeah, absolutely. You're not going to spoil it. Absolutely. And uh, eight or nine years ago, uh, a lot of the brands were branding products that we didn't want our children to eat, like chocolates and biscuits. And there's been a there's been a backlash to that. And things have changed, and, and they've they've realised they have to be more responsible. You know, we've got an obesity crisis in this country and in Europe and around the world, and they've got a responsibility also, like we all have to encourage children to eat the right sorts of foods. And people like Hitch, who own Bob and Thomas, have, have actually really encouraged us and, and helped us to develop these types of product, healthy products because they see that they've got a, you know... A, it's a positive, a, a positive message, yeah, isn't message, it? Yeah, message, yeah. So, yeah. You know, they don't want bad PR. Like, none of us want bad PR. But they've actually gone out their way now to readdress some of the things that were happening in the past and being very, very supportive of us. Okay. You mentioned Asda. Where else are you available? Uh, Ocado Online. Ocado, one of our biggest supporters. They take nearly all of our products. Goodness Direct. They're a a, a, a small and young company uh, in Daventry. They specialise in gluten-free, dairy-free, egg-free type products. They have a full range of products and they deliver to you as well. So they're a very good company. And we've got certain products in different retailers, Sainsbury's, we've got Bob the Builder in Sainsbury's, we've got some products in Tesco. So, but the Ocado, Goodness Direct are our main, where you can get, you know, nearly all of our products in one go. And more about Free From Italy at, would you believe, their website address, which is freefromitaly.co.uk. The answer to that other teaser for you. Uh, oh, incidentally, just uh, coming up, the other side of, uh, of this, in a few moments' time, we're going to be talking about how more and more um, gluten-free menu items are appearing in restaurants, according to some new research. Also, our tweets of the week and mesquite flour mesquite flour this is really intriguing as our series on uh, gluten-free grains and various other flours continues a uh, mesquite flour mm, okay uh, i'm not even sure i've i've even come across that before i don't think i've even tasted it or seen it in the stores but uh, tell you about that in a few moments time and also as i say those new uh, gluten-free items on restaurants becoming more and more available that stat in a few moments time after this and that is about the loft price of gluten-free diets, which, according to this report at money.msm.com, get this, the lofty price of gluten-free diets is hard to swallow. I see what they did there, a little play on words, at the expense of those on a gluten-free diet. Ah, you see, I fell into the trap as well. Overall, Uh, Americans, this is a report from the US obviously, will spend an estimated $7 billion this year on foods labelled gluten-free, according to the consumer research Mintel. Uh, It can be twice as expensive to eat gluten-free, says uh, Alice Bast. Now, Alice is president of the National Foundation for Celiac Awareness. Our surveys tell us this is the number one stressor for celiac patients, especially the newly diagnosed. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is something we've talked about on the programme before, isn't it? Especially when you are uh, new to it and you go down the supermarket aisle and you think to yourself, A, I can't find anything to eat, barely at all, and B, when I do find something, it costs the earth. Burgeoning demand will help the gluten-free market to grow by $4 billion by 2017 at no small cost to the consumer. Uh, One study done at Canada's Dalhousie Medical School compared prices of 56 ordinary grocery items containing gluten with their gluten-free alternatives. Uh, All of the gluten-free products were more expensive, on average costing... What percentage more? 20%. Higher. 50%. Higher. You're not even trying. 
80%. No, no, no. Okay, it's treble digits. Okay, uh, 150% more? No, 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 no. A uh, 200% more is still is still nowhere near. All of the gluten-free products were more expensive on average, costing a jaw-dropping, my jaw dropped, 242% more. British researchers conducted a similar study, found that the premium for gluten-free groceries here in the United Kingdom ranged between 76% more and how much more? Should we, should we go for 242% in the UK as well? Uh-uh. <laughs> oh, okay. You're so naive. 240 What, here? Here? In the UK? Some items costing 242% more than the gluten-filled items? You're having a laugh, aren't you, Uncle Jim? No, higher. What, 342%? No, higher. You're listening to this, aren't you, in other parts of the world, and you're thinking... How can you afford to eat gluten-free in the UK? 442% higher. You're still way off. <clears throat> Take a little cough, clear my throat. I'll read you this sentence in full. British researchers found that the premium for gluten-free groceries ranged between 76% and... 518% more than their wheat-based counterparts. Part of the outsized prices comes from the higher cost that manufacturers incur to make and market gluten-free products. Uh, in August last year, the US Food and Drug Administration issued new strict guidelines for certifying and labelling a food as gluten-free, and that's going to push the cost up as well. Uh, discount chains... Uh, including in the United States, Walmart, uh, and also over here as well, uh, Little and Aldi uh, coming more and more into this market, now carry gluten-free products. This benefits the consumer as it somewhat brought costs down and contributed to an improvement in the taste and texture of gluten-free foods. And I like this final quote. It used to be that a piece of gluten-free bread tasted like the cardboard box it came in, and a powder pasta cost nine ninety nine. Today, finding less expensive gluten-free options is just a matter of shopping around and being more creative in your cooking. And I'd add to that a little addendum and also taking out a second mortgage. This is G-Free Radio. OK, for every bit of bad news, there should be some good news, shouldn't there? For every yang, there should be a ying and so on. For every sweet... There should be a sour. Let's use a, a food reference as uh, it is the G-Free radio show with me, Peter Stewart. Um, so we've had some bad news about the cost. Let's turn to some good news because more than half of US chain restaurants plan to increase their light or low calorie menu the items this year. 52% adding more offerings to their gluten free menu. Uh, diners continue to demand uh, better meal options. This is according to a, a new survey in the US. Uh, so much more information. I mean, I'm sorry if you're elsewhere in the, in, in, in the world, in the UK, obviously my home turf, uh, Europe, um, Australasia. Uh, we've also got listeners I know in Dubai and, uh, and elsewhere across the Middle East. We go far and right, obviously, uh, right around the world. Uh, but so much more information, so much, uh, so many more research documents and surveys and stats coming out of the United States. But this uh, national menu price survey in the US by restaurant supply chain co-op Spend Difference says 52% of US restaurants are going to be adding more offerings to their gluten-free menu. This is really, really good news. The survey also found 37% of chain restaurants intend to serve more locally sourced menu items, and that's pretty good as well for other reasons, and the use of organics will increase by 13%. Uh, there's a growing demand for low-calorie and gluten-free menu items that will be with us for a long time. This is according to that company's president and CEO, Marianne Rose. Quote, operators recognise that a growing number of customers have health related dietary restrictions and they're revamping their menus to include choices for them as well as for those who simply want more healthy choices. Currently 9% of restaurants surveyed serve organic products, 55% have gluten-free menu items, 36% source products locally and 53% offer diners light or low calorie items of restaurants not offering these products 7% say they plan to introduce them on their menus this year however 
<laughs> this made me laugh when I read it for the first time. And you know what? As you just heard, I laughed again when I read it for the second time just now. Offering light or low-calorie meals doesn't always require speciality products. Rose said, Using smaller portions for entrees, adding fresh vegetables and fruits to menu items can avoid supply chain issues. OK, so they're going to make an item low-calorie by giving you a smaller portion, ladies and gentlemen. You could make it up. Do you think the price tag's going to be smaller as well? What do you reckon? Although consumer demand for gluten-free offerings is driving the cost of wheat and most grain products higher, leading to higher menu prices, consumers are willing to pay a premium for meals that meet their dietary needs. Oh, yes. We're used to paying a premium, aren't we? Now the part of the show where I have a little look through my timeline and see some of my favourite uh, G-free tweets of the week that I retweeted over the last seven days or so. So you may be able to uh, to follow me and see some of these items on at G-free radio. Udi's gluten-free mentioned about a sushi wedding cake. It's really weird. It's a fantastic picture. It is looks just like a wedding cake and it's made out of sushi. Uh, and it is, looks really, really weird. So it is gluten-free. So I tell you what, I'm going to retweet that for you. So you will be able to see that again on my timeline at G Free Radio. Uh, Alex Gunn tweeted, I remember my first legal gluten-free beer. And then says, yeah, I guess that does look even worse typed out than it actually sounds. Most of us can remember our first beer, can't we? But a gluten-free one that sounds a little unfortunate, a little sad, doesn't it? Ashley Rodriguez uh, tweeted in the week, eating G-free in an airport equals dry sushi because soy sauce has gluten and gummy worms for dinner. Oh dear, Ashley, I do feel sorry for you, but at least you're eating something. Uh, it is so annoying, isn't it? But you found a way around that. Marcus Barnes, big up the mice that have been nibbling at my bread. I don't think they like gluten and wheat-free. Well, every cloud has a silver lining. At least they're not digging into what you can eat. Uh, Barcat Gluten-Free reminded me we're celebrating our 20th anniversary, so we've decided to revamp our website. So check it out. And if you want to check out uh, their website, it is www glutenfree-foods.co.uk Taylor Mascrosti uh, For people with a gluten allergy it's kind of like kryptonite except Superman didn't find a way to mention it in every conversation Oh dear Do we do that? Do we do tend to, to bang on a little bit about gluten being celiac, don't we? And you know what? That phrase, it's not uh, Talon's uh, phrase. I've seen that many, many times on various Twitter feeds over the course of months and months and months. But it's um, okay. We can have a laugh at ourselves. But I guess uh, the, the message is tone it down a little bit sometimes. Sarah Gregg, it's been a great day so far. I didn't have nightmares last night. I didn't get kidnapped on my run. And the cafe has gluten-free bread. That kind of puts things into perspective for you, doesn't it, Sarah? Uh, Lynn Oliver tweeted, and this was really interesting, the first cookbook devoted to gluten-free diet came out in 1967. And there is a link to that, and it's all discussed at foodtimeline.org. And again, I'm going to retweet that as well. So if you go to at G Free Radio, you'll be able to see that. Uh, also, Nana Akua said, Hi, at G Free Radio, just listened to Friday's show. Fab! We'll try to explore the Asian black bean pasta. Sounds lovely. Uh, so that's great. Thank you, Nana, for uh, for mentioning that. Uh, really, really appreciate it. Always like to get your feedback. Karen Meadows, for those interested, at Allergy UK One has its annual conference for all sufferers on the 26th of April. AllergyUK.org to, uh, to get involved and uh, hear more about that. What else have we got here? Um, well, we've got some more and more and more and more and more. Uh, and uh, a lot of these I've tweeted. So if you want to hear much more about um, 
uh, who we're following and what we're doing and what we're spotting on your behalf at G Free Radio. I'll just leave you with one more from our Twitter feed this week from Sarah Lappert. Some woman took the last gluten-free sandwich because she was giving up gluten for Lent. What about people who have no choice? Hashtag, give me my sandwich. This is G Free Radio. Just before we go this week, let me bring you a little bit about mesquite flour as we continue our seemingly never-ending series. It has to be said, I didn't realise how many gluten-free various grains and flours there were that we could be talking about. Mesquite flour, not something I've uh, come across before. In fact, mesquite is actually a tree. Um, in, in, in particularly the southern United States, uh, and, and I kind of, yeah, I've, I've heard about that now. Did I realise that you could get flour from the mesquite tree? Uh-uh. It bears highly nutritious seed pods. Yeah, you don't strip the bark off or, or, or anything like that, uh, which in turn make an equally nutritious flour that is characterised by its pleasant molasses-like taste. Doesn't that sound intriguing? Mesquite flour, M-E-S-Q-U-I-T-E. It contains a similar health profile to coconut and buckwheat flour. Firstly, it's gluten-free, fibre-rich, comprised of approximately 13 to 17% protein, including the eight essential amino acids. Uh, Naturalnews.com continues by saying it's low in fat and carbohydrates. It has a negligible effect on blood sugar levels. It's packed full of essential minerals, including magnesium and the ever important calcium. Calcium from a tree, guys. Uh, Consequently, consumption of mesquite flour has been linked to weight loss, reduced blood sugar and blood pressure levels and improved energy and moods as well. Mesquite flour can add a punch to smoothies cooked and raw desserts and milk-based drinks and more adventurous cooks might be interested in making some cacao and mesquite flour paleo balls which make great pre-workout snacks. That's intriguing. Boy, oh boy, what have we learned this week on the G-Free Radio Show? Well, we're going to learn some more in seven days' time, brackets, or however often you listen to this show because all of them are archived. You can go back and listen to as many as you want, as often as you want, and they're always free, close brackets. Next week, we travel the furthest distance we have ever gone to talk gluten-free. I didn't do it via Skype. I didn't do it on the phone. I travelled... 8,000 miles, another pair of brackets. I actually was there anyway. I didn't just travel 8,000 miles just for the G3 radio show. Close brackets. We are going to be going to one of the most remote parts of the world. So question, where have I been that's 8,000 miles away from London, England and G3 HQ? I'll bring you that interview next week. Also, we're going to be going to Patagonia bit of a clue and in a couple of weeks time guys we go on a g3 baking course as well don't forget to keep in touch we are at g3 radio and g3 radio.com or g3 radio at hotmail.com was the G Free Radio Show with Peter Stewart and you. Thanks for listening. And remember, until next time, be good, be healthy, and be G Free.